Hello there and welcome to the First Baptist Church Bullhead City. We're going to do our video presentation for the Sunday, uh, May the 17th service and we're glad to have you with us. Uh, some of you are listening to us from out of state and even out of the country so we're glad to have you folks aboard. We thank you for uh, tuning in to us and we're going to open this service with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, the gifts that you give us. We thank you that we're safe from this virus. We're, we're staying at home and we're staying safe. Father, we thank you for the protection you provided. And we ask you to bless all the people that are within the sound of my voice, Father. Let them uh, stay well, stay healthy, and stay strong, Father. We just ask to send the Holy Spirit today to be in this place, to be with us, Father, and to bless the people that hear the, the music and the words that uh, come from your book. Father, we know that the, you are a complete blessing to us, and we know that the Bible is the, the greatest possession of mankind. So, Father, we praise you and honor you because you are worthy. Thank you, and in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, we've asked the Holy Spirit to be with us today, and he is here. announcements. Um, the governor of Arizona has uh, rescinded the order to stay at home and some of the restaurants are beginning to open with certain rules of course about social distancing and there's a church or two that are beginning to open but the ones that we know that are opening are uh, having people call in and make reservations to be there. They're uh, spacing individual chairs out six feet. We don't have chairs we have pews and uh, they're telling people they have to come to church in a mask and gloves. Now, the mask and gloves part doesn't bother us, but we think here at the First Baptist Church, after meeting with our two deacons, Deacon Wayne and myself and Pastor Roy, that it would be better to wait just a little bit longer before we open the church to uh, a general audience, so to speak, a general congregation coming in. And the reason why is because the health officials are anticipating a sort of second wave of the coronavirus. They're opening things up because now they have enough hospital beds to deal with a second wave. And so we kind of want to wait and see just how that's going to look. Uh, the main thing uh, is that we want to keep our congregation safe. Um, we don't want to challenge this, uh, this virus because we know it's very dangerous. Uh, as of this date, there are well over 80,000 people that have died and uh, the numbers are still, uh, still growing, although it looks like Arizona is reaching its peak about now. But we want to be very careful. And when we come back, we want to come back uh, well and right and, and safe. So we're uh, anticipating possibly opening on the last Sunday of May. That would be the 31st of May. That would be the earliest that we're going to open right now because we want to see if there is a second wave. We want to see if there's a, another issue that comes because it, it could be uh, even worse than the first time around. So we want to be very cautious about that. We want to take care of you, but we also want to be back in church. Uh, we're going to have some mission moment pictures. We received some pictures out of the Philippines this week uh, from one of the pastors that we support over there. So we're going to uh, see some stuff from Pastor Malcolm's church. Malcolm is down in one of the larger cities, and if you notice in the lower right corner, the little white outline, if you can see it on the screen, is a dove. So these churches don't have windows, but they have bars over open spaces, and they have a dove and uh, they're doing some work on their church. They're painting, actually, I think they're painting uh, some black wrought iron into a blue. Uh, on the next
next picture, they're still uh, up on the ladder painting. There's some of the people. And in the, in the lower corner uh, of the next picture, you'll see a cross in the lower right-hand corner. And uh, that's one of the crosses. They're doing some painting. It looks like they're painting white on that one. And so they're painting the churches. Now, apparently some of the uh, stuff they're using are some paint brushes that we sent. And so, you know, we're still making an impact with that church. And that's a city church. Obviously, they have a building. They don't have, uh, you know, walls and windows like we do, but uh, that's one of their church buildings. Next slide is uh, one of the guys getting ready to do some work down at that church. It's also uh, Pastor Malcolm's church down there. And if you want to go to the next slide, Pastor Malcolm is uh, he's actually Welsh. He's from Wales, which is north of England. And he's uh, been over in the Philippines for years, apparently. And he's uh, got the church in the city there. And he's one of the people who receives uh, the boxes that we send to them. And uh, that's Pastor Malcolm. Uh, he's, a, you know, he, he's not just a sit back and let the world pass by kind of guy. He's a get in there and, and uh, get dirty and work hard. And, and uh, he's got a, a very strong ministry going down in the Philippines. Uh, I believe that's the last picture we have this week. Uh, we're going to go on then and we're going to do a little bit more music before we turn it over to Pastor Roy. And we are, we've been asked to do a little special song this week, and so I'm going to attempt it myself here. And it's a Jim Reeves song. I would actually have to admit he has a slightly better voice than mine, but I'm going to attempt it anyway. <clears throat> should not be kept a secret. So spread the joy, spread the word, and draw people close. God is looking for everybody. We have another song to do here, and a little bit different than what we usually do, but uh, someone suggested that we do a medley. And uh, we like medleys. 
especially these old medleys, of the bluegrass type. So we're going to uh, do something a little bit different here. Let's see here. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed, are you washed in the blood of in the blood in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Brother Bob, Miss Beth, 
Are you washed in the blood? Do you know Jesus? Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Folks, there's never been a more important time for that than right now. It seems that whenever a catastrophe happens in this world, whether it be man-made, whether it be natural, the churches flood with people. Everyone comes together. Everyone pulls together. You begin to see love. You begin to see a relationship between people. You begin to see that in catastrophe, we are better. We are better people. Because everyone knows about God, in spite of what they say, in spite of atheist, agnostic, no matter what you are, you know in your heart that there's a God there. You know he exists, you know he has the right plan, but we fight against it. We fight against it. Even though we know inherently that we shouldn't. There are situations where we know better, but we choose not to do better. And I was talking with a friend of mine on the phone the other night, and we're talking about the coronavirus and the things in this world, and, and the, how Christians are being persecuted, how people are just, you know, just totally walking away from God, and how governments have walked away, and judicial system of education. And he said, you know, he said, I feel like we're just facing a big gun. He said, I feel like we wake up every morning and we're facing a big gun. And I thought about that, and I prayed about that, and I thought, yep, we're looking right down the barrel. Right down the barrel is very frightening to a lot of people. It's imposing because they're thinking, you're looking down the barrel of something, that's not good. Most of us who are shooters, and even those who aren't, want to be on the other end of that situation. We want to be behind there where the trigger is. We don't want to be in front of it, but many people would have you believe, frankly, that guns are the problem. It's guns. Guns are doing this. Firearms are doing this. I carry firearms. I own firearms. I can take my firearm and lay it on the floor out there in the middle of this sanctuary, and I guarantee you, without human intervention, that gun will never hurt anyone. That firearm will never hurt anyone. You can look down the barrel all day long, and that gun is not going to bother you. It's not going to shoot you. You know, it, we talk, and a lot of people of liberal nature, they'll say, well, if you had no guns, you'd have no problem. Okay, if those who don't learn from history are condemned to repeat it, so let's go back to World War II. World War II, guns were the problem, but no, they weren't. Because two main reasons here. Number one, those who had the guns, who took the guns away from everybody else, had too much power and abused it. We saw it very clearly in Nazi Germany. People couldn't defend themselves because they didn't have a weapon, they didn't have a firearm. God intends for you to defend yourself. God intends for you to pray to him for wisdom and knowledge, but God intends for you to be a warrior. Prayer warriors have an impact. Let me tell you a little story about that that just, just hit. I had a phone call um, earlier in the week from a friend of mine in Asia. Her cousin had fallen overboard working on the merchant ship. And they didn't hold out any hope for him. And those of you who have ever really, truly been out to sea, I'm not talking about the lake, I'm not talking about the river, I'm not even talking about the Chesapeake Bay, which I, where I grew up can be pretty horrendous at times. I'm talking about really and truly out to sea. Know that if you fall overboard at sea, your chances of survival are kind of slim. He fell overboard at sea. They had lost all hope, but they wanted us to pray prayer warriors here and in fact around the world, people I've talked to in other states, around the world, Asia, Russia, prayed. A little over two days later, he was found by a Sulevanese fisherman. Alive, folks. That's the power of prayer. God wants us to be warriors. He wants us to be prayer. He is now recovering in a hospital in Asia. So you need the power. You need the power of prayer in your life. God wants us to be strong. He wants us to be prayer warriors. The second reason, other than, than the fact that too much power lies with those who have the guns, in Okinawa, where I spent a lot of time, when the Chinese came over, took away all the weapons in Okinawa, the 
Joe Canales said, no problem. Human nature is to improvise. And yes, folks, in spite of what people may tell you, you can kill somebody with a fork or a spoon or with your hands or so. What the Okinawans did was the Chinese were very suspicious. And then the Japanese, the Imperial Army and the Japanese, were even more suspicious because Okinawa, in the position where it sits in, has a very diverse culture, a little bit different than traditional Japanese. So all the weapons were gone, right? No. The Okinawans took what was a normal rice grinder. It's a stick with a handle attached. It's what you used to grind out, grind out rice by hand. And they turned it into a tonfa, which is a martial arts weapon. About 60 years later, a guy in Fitzwilliam, Fitzwilliam, New Hampshire, turned it into something called a PR-24, police baton. It's a weapon that can be deadly. I use them in my practice of the martial arts. Not only did the Okinawans do that, they took a normal boat war bomb. And if you have ever seen anyone involved in a martial arts do kata or forms with an oar, you know real quick it can be deadly. They took a bow, a long staff, they took a cane. I happen to be a fifth degree black belt in Chinese cane fighting. I'm going to tell you something. You know, I would rather somebody come out with me something short like a knife than someone with a cane because they have a whole lot of reach. So taking away the guns is not going to help. My point here is that as you stare down the barrel with all the other thoughts you have, one should be of common sense and the wisdom of God. If you want to look down the barrel, and if you don't, people say, well, no one would ever look down the barrel. Hmm, that's odd. And we talk about, and I don't want to group people together, but, but frankly, you know, when you talk about about liberal mentality, when you talk about artists, they tend to stick together. Well, an artist would never do anything like that. I beg to differ. 1982, October of 1982, Peter Jennings on ABC News came on there, and it was about a work of art. This was a work of art that people were registering months in advance to see and experience. Check it out. You can look it up. The work of art was a chair. And in order to experience this work of art, you had to sit in this chair. When you sat in this chair, a 12-gauge under and over shotgun was feet away from you pointed in your face. And guess what? It was on a timer, an electronic timer, set to go off randomly sometime within the next 10 years. That is truth, folks. People lined up literally for miles to experience this, to look down the barrel. What were they looking for? They were searching for the same thing that I see people searching for now, answers. What lies beyond? What lies beyond the virus? You see all the questions, and you see them questioned to government officials. You see them questioned to medical officials. You see them questioned to the media, which frankly well, is a wrong place to ask anybody anything. I'm sorry. My opinion, I will express that here. Because you don't get facts anymore from the media. You get opinions. And it used to be called, back in Peter Jennings' time, editorialism. Now it's called news. They were looking for something they couldn't find. Were they afraid? Very well could have been. But they're more afraid of the unknown. But I'm here to tell you today, when you look right down the barrel and you have Jesus in your heart, you're looking to victory. God has you, folks. He has you. Use your discernment. Use God's wisdom rather than your own. And find the victory. Deuteronomy 31, 6, 8. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. And Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you must go with this people into the land that God swore to their ancestors to give them. And you must divide it among them as their inheritance. The Lord himself, listen folks, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. 
As Moses spoke that day, it is also true today, no matter what. Panic, fear, bravado, resistance to authority, born of fear, I see it all in this time of this pandemic. But it's not the answer. The answer is God. God will go before you. God will protect you. The answer is not to violate the law. And people say, well, that's man's law, not God's law. But God spoke very clearly on this. God speaks to us. God told us very clearly. Romans 13, 1 and 2. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, Whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment upon themselves. Period. I suggest you read this whole chapter. God is in control, folks, and we ask why, but we don't need to ask why. We're actually childish when we do that. Children will not childish. My question to these folks doing these things, outwardly, socially, gathering, outwardly hugging each other in public, outwardly saying, I don't need a mask. Number one, my question to them is, where is your concern for your fellow man? You may be okay, but what about the person who has a weakened immune system? What about the person who has uh, respiratory problems? My brother Bob, I want to thank him for doing that song that was actually requested, um, was sent to me by two young ladies who right now Sheltering in place in Cheyenne, Wyoming. I want to thank him for doing this song, but what a lot of people don't know about Bob, in spite of all his talent that he very so humbly says he doesn't have, my brother Bob has a respiratory issue. And if you go out there and you don't have a mask on and you run up and hug Bob and you wind up transferring this COVID-19 to him and something happens to him, that's on you. That's on you. Don't be rebelling just for the purpose of rebelling. I won't listen to the government. That's fine. If you want to do that, you go do it somewhere where you're not going to affect someone else. Go do it somewhere you're not going to affect someone else. At some point, at some point, when you close that mind off that's telling you to think as the devil wants you to think and resist and be convinced by the Father and the Lord of illusion, when you close that mind up and open that heart and God comes in there, God's going to say, no, my child. Act in love. Be aware and respectful of other people. If you love them, respect them. And if you respect them, do what's right. I see this all the time, and, and it just, it really, it freaks me out, frankly. Where is our faith? Where? Depend upon your faith. But don't let the fact that you're depending upon your faith let you go beyond. He told us we would be tested. God told us we would face trial. So many are afraid of the loss of human life. And so many are dancing in a lightning storm just to prove how brave they are. But where is the concern for the eternal soul? Where is it? You don't see it. Satan has deceived us to the point where we think this is all there is. We risk the loss. We risk eternal damnation because Satan has deceived us. It reminds me of a story. Three guys sitting around a campfire. And the subject of death came up. And one guy said, well, when I die, I want to be remembered as a humanitarian. Someone who made the earth better for everyone else. He said, and I try. I do, I do things for humanitarian causes, and I help build houses, and I help do shelters, and I help everything I know. I truly want my legacy to be that man was a humanitarian. And the second guy spoke up and said, you know, when they come to see me, when they gather around, that's what we're talking about, right, guys? Oh, yeah, that's, that's what I was talking about. He said, when they come to see me, and I'm there laid out, I want everybody to be sp speaking about he was a great family man. His family came first. Nothing came ahead of his family. He sacrificed everything for his family. The third guy didn't say anything. They both look at him and say, well, what do you want them to say? And the guy raised his head slowly and said, I want him to say, look, he's moving, he's sitting up. <laughs> Clinging 
to that, clinging to that human life. Clinging to that human life. Last week I talked about Mother's Day and, and the great gift that they are. You know, mothers would tell children when they're small, don't touch, it'll burn. Don't stick your tongue in that light socket. That's not going to turn out well. Don't drive like that. And with the loss of motherhood and the loss of parenting, we see the loss of mentioning that you'll make mistakes, but don't neglect your spiritual life. God forgives, but you have to ask for forgiveness. You have to open your heart. And that's one of the biggest things I see nowadays, is people do everything that they do without a sense of responsibility. I experienced this morning, I went into a local store and someone just acted like they owned the earth. There was a big, big sign. I'll tell you, I was at Dollar Tree down here. Big sign, no cutting in line. There are four or five of us in line and we're spaced out. And this woman just cuts in front of all of us, just ignores us all. Of course, the lady behind me had some choice words to say to her and we finally got it straightened out. But it's like, you're not aware of anyone else. We're in our own little show, we're in our own little world. Folks, we're not here alone. We aren't. There are other people here that we need to be cognizant of. And in your behavior, in your inner reactions, you need to show that you're respectful of everyone else. Well, I don't care. Okay, tell you what, why don't you not care out in the middle of the desert somewhere? People that tell me that doesn't sound very pastoral. I know I'm going to get a lecture from Bob when this sermon's over. It doesn't sound pastoral, but you know what? You know what? If you are that selfish, if you are that selfish, maybe a walk in a desert will show you the light. Maybe it'll show you the light. Maybe it'll show you that you're not here by yourself. There are other people. And at some point when you become delirious from walking in the desert, you know what? You're finally going to see the light. And at that point, that point when you understand that you're not alone because God is with you when you can't walk that last mile to get that water, when you can't find a way, when you can't find that power, when you're tossed at sea like that young man was for a couple of days and God puts out that hand and rescues you, then you'll see the light, then you'll understand. If it takes that to bring you to God, then so be it. And if someone accuses me of being non-pastoral because of it, Go ahead. It's not something that hasn't been said before. <laughs> well, you need to wake up, folks. This is a wake-up call for all of us to wake up and understand that no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're facing, your friends can't get you through it. The government can't get you through it. But God has a plan, and he has the answer right there. He has the answer. Stop looking everywhere else for it. I had to, to counsel some people last week, and I finally had to put together a packet for them uh, on a child being raised uh, wicked. I'll come out and say it. And as I went through and, and looked at all the material I had on that, and I was putting it together, I was thinking, how do people turn this way? And when you go back and you research the, the man who actually made that popular, in, first in Europe and then it gravitated to the United States, Anyone who looks at that with any judgment and discernment whatsoever can see he had only one motivation. He had only one motivation. You know, he thought he was a rooster in a, in a hen house where there were no other roosters. That's how he drew them together. Power and money and control over women. That's what he gained, period. And I'll say it right here. You know? Light up YouTube all you want with the comments. I don't care. And I'll say it right here because it's the truth. Folks, that doesn't need to be our motivation. Our motivation should be pure. Our motivation should be God's will. And if you don't do that, you're going to bring judgment on yourselves. I promise you it's coming. And I don't want that. Everything I stand up here and say today, I say because I love you. And I want to see you in heaven. I really want to see you in heaven. 1 John 1, 8 through 10, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Don't have a Facebook account here 
And when I was in Asia, it, it was absolutely necessary because that's just how they communicate. And I can remember one time someone was saying, what is this and what is this? And I saw all these posts and I put on a, on, a, on a post there. As a pastor, I said, I am a sinner. I will be a sinner until the day I die. There are going to be times when I'm going to think wrong, talk wrong, speak wrong. But you know what? I am a child of a forgiving God. And it goes on to number 90. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Amen. And I posted on Facebook that I was a sinner. And you wouldn't believe the number of people. What are you doing, a pastor, if you're a sinner? I mean, over and over and over. I, I got it. I mean, I must have had thousands of responses. You know? What are you doing calling yourself a pastor? I said, I don't call myself a pastor. I've been ordained by several faiths throughout the world, Ecuador, Asia, here in the United States. But I don't call that my ordination. Yes, I appreciate it, recognize it, but you know what? I was ordained by God. God was the one who sent me into the mission field 20 odd years ago. And God is the one that I confess my sins to, period. Not someone in a, in, a, in a room somewhere, you know. If I offend you or if I do something against you and it's something I did, I will, as a person, apologize to you because God wants me to do that. But when I confess my sins and everything that I do wrong, when I stand in front of that mirror every morning and I talk about, I talk to God. I repent my sins. And I don't care about being ostracized. <laughs> that would bother me a bit. If you're picking on me, you're leaving someone else alone, number one. And number two, if you're more concerned about my sins, then guess what? You're not concerned about your own. And God sees that too. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Amen. Folks, we are unpure. We are unrighteous to the depth of our core. And we are saved not by our actions, not by our words, not by our intentions, but by God's grace alone. Period. And you can't sweeten that. You can't make that sound any better. Well, it's kind of harsh, Pastor. Yeah, reality is sometimes harsh. If I could bring some of these people out of this virtual world they live in, I would be a very, very happy person. It's not my number one thing I want to do, but you know what? If it brings one more person to God because they understand that the virtual world, by definition, is not reality. I'm telling you, it would make me a very happy person. You know, when I was talking about uh, different religions and things, and I, I mentioned Wiccan, I was talking to a friend of mine, a pastor or whatever, and he said, you better be careful, man. And he said, they might put a root on you. Now, those of you unfamiliar with, with, uh, with voodoo and, and witchcraft and things like that, a, a root, not a root, it's spelled R-O-O-T, but it's a root. Putting a root on somebody is essentially putting a curse on them. And, of course, he was laughing. He's a pastor friend of mine or whatever, and I said, you know what? You can call on the root all you want. I'll call on God. We'll see what wins out. We'll see who wins out. I don't worry about that. And the other thing that you face in this world, where you face all those, those, those things that you, that you encounter, the other 4,800 plus religions in the world, no matter what they be, and believe me, there's some of them out there where I, I can't even begin to fathom. I know about the religions because I have to. If you go into a foreign country and you're going to preach the gospel to people, you better know something about their religion going in there. Because if you don't, you're not going to get the door open. So yes, I am. I do have knowledge on all these 4,800 plus religions, all religions in the world. But you know what? You know what? Only one of them has a living God. Only one of them. In the end, the others all said, well, we don't know the meaning of life. We don't know the meaning of peace. We don't know the meaning of the joy said, I am the truth and the light and the way. And he is. He absolutely is. I don't worry about roots. I don't worry about curses. You know, we become blinded, folks. And we as pastors are equally guilty. We become more concerned with filling those pews, with filling those coffers, with buying that airplane, with having five mansions. You know? 
And we begin to tickle the ears, as my brother Pastor Ed would say. We begin saying things that are pleasing to the people in the audience so that they'll come back next week and bring a friend. Folks, if that's what you want to hear, you're listening to the wrong person. Because I'm telling you, I'm not here to tickle your ear. I'll give you the word of God, unabridged, uncorrected, because you can't correct. Someone said to me the other day, well, you need to correct that in the Bible. Whoa, wait a minute. I'm glad I'm not standing next to you because I'm looking out for that lightning bolt. Uh -huh. You're going to correct the word of God. Wow, who do you think you are? Well, it just doesn't, it, you can't, it doesn't transfer well. People don't understand. It's about the presentation. You don't have colors and slides, and you don't have this, and you don't have that. Yeah, it's funny to me that, you know, and you see all these presentations, you see this and see that, and, and my good friend, again, it, it was Brother Bob. Bob said, you know, he said, it's, it's odd to me that it's worked for 2,000 years, but suddenly or whatever, we have to be the kings of technology. He said that to me several months ago. He may not remember saying it, but he, but he, he actually said that to me. That's always been all you need right there. God's word. God's word. Not ours. Not ours. Not some worldly interpretation of it that makes it pleasing to the ear. And it tickles. It's fun. I can't wait to go back to church and hear him talk more about how good life is and how everything's going to be fine. Look outside, folks. Things aren't fine. You got a virus out there killing people. You got people that, for their own motivations, are either totally resisting and saying, we won't wear a mask and we'll go shake hands and we'll hug each other. I'm free. Again, I'm going to go back to you again, Bob, whatever. Yep, the Constitution says you're free. You're also free to die. Just don't stand a little to the right there or don't want you falling in front of me. I'm next in line. I don't want anybody cutting. Truthfully, why are we doing this? To show how strong we are? Show how powerful we are? To show that no one controls us? Control is an illusion. Believed by normally infantile egomaniacs. Control is a total illusion. You don't have control over anything in your life. If you're lucky, when you're younger, you have control over your physical faculties, if you're lucky. And that only lasts for a short time, believe me. And the older I get, the more I'm, I'm, I'm finding that out. Well, I used to. No. Can't do it anymore. Control is an illusion, folks. And illusions are all brought about by one entity, Satan. Satan is fooling you. And he's making you think you're a big person or that this is all there is or that. People say, well, what's in it for Satan? I love it when they say that. Man, they gave me an opening. That's almost like I'm looking at me and saying, tell me more. I love that. What's in it for Satan? Why is he doing this? Your eternal soul. What if I'm wrong? Let's look at this both ways. If you're wrong about God, if he doesn't exist, and I know he does, but let's, for the sake of argument, if you were wrong, if you say, if you go to church, become righteous, do what God wants you to do, and if you're wrong, you go on the ground, according to the worldly beliefs, and you're done. Yeah? Okay. What if you're right? What if you believe in God and you're right? All your buddies that, that thought this world was it, they're going to hell. State Farm's not going to have that kind of fire control. It doesn't protect back there. Okay? But you're going to heaven. You're going with God going to be with them forever. You're going to get to enjoy being in his company. You'll have no pain, no sickness. You'll have no concerns, no stress. And you'll be living next to God. Wow, folks. So what I'm telling you is, you're looking for the bigger, better deal? This is a no-lose deal. But I'll be missing out on things in life. That's what the young folks say. Okay. What will we be missing out on? Well, I want to I want to drink and party and do this until I'm 35. And I told you, no one's guaranteed tomorrow. Just got news that the, uh, a member of a family of, of the church here passed away at 41. 41 years old. Most people at 16, 35. And once we get older, we tend to adjust that age. I'm telling you folks, I did it. 
When I was 13, 25 was old. When I got 25, 35 was old. When I got 35, 55 was old. And it keeps going up. Then I came here from 7,700 miles away, and I met Wayne, who's in his 80s, and he makes me feel like I'm 202. So, you know, I mean, this man jumps and runs at 83. So I'm now up to the little more. I think, I think 100 is still a teenager if, if you go by Wayne's methods. So we're good. Folks, we don't have tomorrow. It's not promised. It's not guaranteed. So we need to do this today. Admit that you've sinned. Admit that you've sinned. It's very simple. Love God. Move forward. Move forward in your relationship with Him. Learn. Wow. I mean, we're supposed to learn in this life. You know? I keep forgetting that. I want to go ahead and admit it right here on the screen, Bob. I keep forgetting that. I got a button here I'm supposed to push, and I'm pointing my finger. And Wayne's back there just laughing because he's got it. Thank you, Brother Wayne. Romans 6, 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we go on shining, sinning? So that grace may increase? <laughs> That's a mentality sometimes in people. So, well, if God will take me any time right up until the last minute when I'm dying, why can't I just live the life of a party? And then before I draw that last breath, I said, I'm yours, God, and God will take me. And yes, indeed, if you mean it in your heart, you confess to him and you say, Lord, take me. If your last words are, I'm yours, Lord, you're good. Then why can't I party right up until that moment? Because you don't know when that moment's going to be. Is it really worth the risk? Number two says, by no means we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? The lost say that they do it because of freedom. I'm free to do this. 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 And in fact, They've lost their freedom. They are saved, slaves to that sin. They are slaves to the bottle. They are slaves to the next hit of cocaine. They are slaves to the next drop of acid. They are slaves to the meth and the heroin and anything else that they're encountered with. They are slaves to the gambling. They are slaves to their status. Look at this. I got the biggest house in the neighborhood. Well, let's go inside and look. Oh, no, no, no. Go inside and look. Looks like a movie set. Anybody ever been in a movie set? And I, I was years ago. They did the movie George Washington in Virginia, and they built this beautiful example of his house, Mount Vernon, on the James River. Problem was that they built it on the James River down in Williamsburg. It looked grand until you opened the door. <laughs> there was nothing inside. It was just a show. And I've also been in million-dollar homes on the outside, walked inside, and seen shells because it's all about the image. Is it going to be about the image? If it's all about the image, folks, you're living in sin. We are those who have died to sin. You have to die to sin. You have to be dead to it. And that like has to have an impact on your life. It can't have an impact. The lost say they're doing it for freedom, but they are slaves to sin. But Christians are still unrighteous on their own. It's a sinful nature of man. And by God's grace, we can be dead to sin if we're in that word. Be dead to sin. Be in his word. Believe in the power of prayer. Know that he's going to heal you. Know that he has a plan. We're going to get through this. We're going to look right down the barrel of that coronavirus. Look right down the barrel of an oncoming vehicle. Look right down the barrel of that shotgun when you're sitting in that chair and know that we're going to get beyond it because of God. Because he has us. But in order to do that, we need to have died to sin and no longer live within sin. Romans 6, 3 through 5 says, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism 
into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Amen. Amen. It's misinterpreted here. So much is misinterpreted in the Bible nowadays by people wanting to have pleasing sermons, by people wanting to have their ears tickled. It's misinterpreted. It's forgotten that we died, and we died before we were born. Because he died on the cross for all of our sins. He took on human sin in human form. Amen? Human sin in human form. All of it. Through the ages. The people yet unborn. He took it all on. And he died. And was resurrected. That we may be resurrected in love of obedience to and faith in him. In order to live an eternal life. Not a mortal life. Not one with constraints. I'm free. I'm free. Yeah, you're free to die. Not only are you free to die and lose, lose this human life, you're free to die and be condemned to eternal damnation. But you're also free to live. He's knocking on the door. Your heart, you're free to live. You can be in heaven. You can see your mother who wants you there that I talked about last week. You can see your buddies. But you got to let go of the sin. you got to let it go. Be dead to it. Take the gift that he gave us. Yeah, I, I was looking at something the other day, and, and someone talked about it. said, when you go in the auditorium of the church, and I was like, that doesn't just sound like, just doesn't sound like. To me, it's always been a sanctuary. When I stand up here, I stand on holy ground. Amen? This is holy ground. When you stand up here, your praise and worship had better be properly motivated. It's not a performance. It's not entertainment. It's praise and worship to God. It's the motivation. I keep saying it over and over. People say, where do you find that in the Bible? It's okay. Where do I find it? Over and over I can find it in the Bible. But look at it. The Bible tells us that an adulterer does not commit adultery in the physical act. An adulterer commits that adultery when he thinks the thought and has it in his heart to do it. When you stand up here and you pontificate and you perform, you're not doing it for pure reasons, and guess what? God knows it. This is holy ground, folks. When you set foot in this sanctuary, it's holy ground. Let your intentions be pure. And if they're not pure, say to him, Father, I'm screwing up. Help me out. And he's got you. He has you. Be resurrected. Be resurrected by the gift of Jesus Christ by losing all that sin. They sung it earlier in the song. Those garments that are stained, white as snow, folks. Let the blood that he shed at Calvary wash you clean, your soul. Enjoy the resurrection that he gave you. Don't forget that. Pastors, don't soft soap it. Don't be tickling ears out there. Did both that time. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. It's gone. That we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Recently had to counsel a couple where the husband... Um, and wife had different views on Christianity, and I won't get into them because I don't want to pick on anybody's religion too much. You know, that's a joke. Um, but the main thing that they had an issue over was Christians saying they were born again. And in the particular faith, one of the, one of the partners' particular faiths, it was, uh, you know, what do you mean born again? We are born spiritually dead. Spiritually dead. When we say we are reborn in Christ, we are a new creation. When we baptize people here a little while back in that baptism, arise a new soul, a new creation in Jesus Christ. Amen? Right. Because 
The baptism of water is just symbolic. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is what makes you a new creation. Go forth and sin no more, brother and sister. Go forth and sin no more. You have died. We forget that. We forget it and we go back to the old ways. The old self was crucified before I was born. I was loved that much. You were loved that much. And you're free because he paid. Because remember, folks, we got Memorial Day coming up. All you guys know I was in the Marine Corps. And I love all my military brothers, no matter what service you were in, and those who went before us. Wake up out there because freedom isn't free. At some point, someone paid for it. If it was a world war, someone paid for it. If it's your sin, he paid for it on the cross at Calvary. Period. It's not free. We'll see all these celebrations at Memorial Day and they'll forget the sacrifices. The military guys gave us freedom from tyranny. But to a Christian who died and was set free, with Jesus and what he did at Calvary, that's a debt we can never forget. In your heart, you've got to remember that. You've got to know that. You've got to not forget it every day. If you, don't, if you forget everything else, the name of, the, the, of you know, your high school sweetheart, your anniversary might also get you killed, but you know, your wife's birthday, which will definitely probably get you hurt. And if you forget all those things, it's forgiven. But you can't forget the sacrifice that he made. You can't. And if you go back into sin, you've forgotten it. If you, if you, you know, you used to be a do unto others, as they will have them do unto you. I saw a bumper sticker uh, today, as a matter of fact, on the back of the pickup truck, and it said, do unto others. Not, 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 then split. <laughs> do unto others, then run away. That's the mentality. That's a mentality that we're living in nowadays, and it's scary. There's no room for it. We were set free by his sacrifice. But you know, sin sort of reminds you of a termite. It reminds you of a termite. You look at a house on the outside. Man, that thing is pretty, isn't it? Wow, looks good. Sin's the same way. You look at a guy, he's coming to church, he's doing this, he's doing that. He, I mean, he's, he's a humanitarian, he's a family man. He's doing all the things he should be. But is his faith truly grounded in Christ? Is there a good foundation there? Or is it all just show? Is it all window dressing? You know, I see a lot of these, and I'm going to pick up the pastors on TV again. Probably get myself in trouble again. But I see them and they're, they're saying, preaching about this and saying this and saying this and saying this. And I say, hmm. someone sent me an article last night and it showed how um, the entertainers and, the, and uh, some of the entertainers, some of the football players, uh, Drew Brees comes to mind. They donated $5 million to, to, I guess, the COVID virus. But the local pastor there of a mega church had donated zero. <laughs> ah. So it'll put you on the spot, doesn't it? Have termites infected your faith? Have they eaten away at the foundation? Have they gotten you to the point where it's all a show and it's all a shell? He's God. Tell him about it. Turn back. You can do it. He's always there for you. He's always got that hand out. Sin, sin just creeps in. And that's because of the world that we live in. And Satan controls the world. I'm learning here, guys. Now, if we die with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastered over him. Death, where is that victory? Death has no more victory. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Amen, amen, amen. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. Come to the Father through the Son. 
Because that's how we were saved. The gift given to us, given to us by Jesus, that's how we go to the Father, through the Son. We're saved. We're good. We don't have to worry about it anymore. As long as we live in Christ. Worship Him truly, with the right intentions. Not to be a big person in church or not to show someone how nice or good you are. Worship Him because you love Him, because He loved you. He gave His life for you. Yeah. No matter what you do, don't think, as some people sometimes do, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? No. Uh, you got a free pass, take full advantage. That's a head in the lion's mouth mentality. I'm going to go stick my head in the lion's mouth and see if I can test God. Don't do it. Sitting in front of that shotgun, voluntarily, in the name of art, voluntarily going and sitting in front of a 12-gauge over and under shotgun that could go off at any moment. Wow. That's a gamble. Definitely gamble. Don't be a gambler. Not with your eternal soul. Every gambler is only looking for a sure thing. Every single gambler, if you walk over to the casinos when they reopen, every single gambler is looking for a sure thing. If you don't believe it, look how many suckers there or whatever will, will be in there and they'll be betting on horse races and tell me, I I got a hot tip. Now, what he does though is he goes around to nine people. If there are nine horses in the race, he goes to nine people. And he tells each one a different number. And then whichever wins, he goes back to that guy and says, I told you I had a hot tip. And he gets, it, and he gets his money. Now the other eight, <laughs> they're looking for him at some point. You know, I got a hot tip for you. Right now. I'm going to stand up here as a pastor in a church and say, I got a hot tip for you. Bet on God. Bet on God. That's a sure thing. I'll guarantee it. I laid my life there years ago and the greatest thing that I ever did. My life will never be the same because of God. Don't go on sinning. Don't keep trying him. Don't say, I'll do it until I'm 35 and live to be 34 and 364 days. Oops! That's a big oops, guys. You better have some asbestos underwear. Uh -huh. Don't do it. Go to him. Know that he's got you and understand that no matter what you do in life. Matthew 4, 7, Jesus answered him. It's also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. In Luke 4, 12, we see Jesus answered. It is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Deuteronomy 6, 16 repeats it again. Do not put the Lord your God to the test as you did at Massa. Folks, when you see something mentioned several times in the Bible, it's for a reason. Just like that teacher who was trying to teach you math or algebra, it's important. In this case, it's much more important. When you ignore the authorities, when you ignore the law, when you intentionally go stick your head in the lion's mouth, you're putting God to the test. But by the same token, when you say, I don't worry about it, and I, you know, I won't wear a mask, and I won't wear gloves, and you know, I'll go do what I want when I want, again, you're putting the Lord to the test. He was not meant to be tested. This is a test of faith. Every trial you go through in life is a test of faith. On the other side of a trust of faith is a blessing. And we will be blessed when this is over with. We will have great blessings. We will have learned from it, hopefully. We will have become a kinder, gentler people towards each other, hopefully. But most of all, people say when this is over, the churches are going to be full. I hope so. And I don't want them just to be full of whatever Christians. I love all my Christian brothers and what I want them here. I want the lost in here. If you're watching this video today and you're lost and you don't know where to go next, you don't know where to go next. I see this all the time. Two people saying that they love each other. One person showing them a symbol of love. Look what's at the end of that. If you look at that picture closely, you're going to see that there's a light there. It's the light of a new day. It can be the light of a new day in your life. Today can be the first day of the rest of your life. Reach out to God. 
if you're lost, if you've known God, but you've made mistakes, repent. Come back to him. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm about to pray a prayer, and I'd like for you to pray with me. And we'll make it short and sweet. Should we pray? Father, I'm lost. I feel like I'm, I'm looking down the barrel of a gun. I feel like I'm, I'm looking into the, a great abyss. I'm looking into darkness, and I don't know where to go next. But, Father, I want light. Father, bring me the light. Bring me the love. I'm letting go. I want to let you go. Father, take me now. Amen. Say those words. Father, take me now. You'll look at this world through love, and you'll see the light at the end of that tunnel. You'll see the light down the end of that barrel. You'll see that God has you, and your life will never be the same or the wrong. Well, thank you, Pastor Roy. We are indeed looking down the barrel of a gun with this coronavirus. But we're going to uh, have victory very soon. Once again, uh, we're hoping that by the 31st of May, if there's not a serious second wave, that uh, we can get back and uh, do our church as we normally do. That would be a wonderful thing. And uh, if you, uh, if we do open up on the 31st of May and and uh, you know have ourselves a regular service, feel free to bring your uh, bring your mask. We're probably still going to be uh, socially distancing for some months to come. So uh, the coronavirus isn't going to suddenly disappear, but we're going to have to be smart. We're going to have to be careful to keep ourselves safe. Um, before we go, let me remind you, too, that uh, we're doing this on YouTube. And if you would push the subscribe button to the lower right, that would help us some. We want to get as many subscribers as we can. And uh, that will help us with the YouTube folks. And uh, we're happy to have you here with us every week. We have a lot of people tuning in to our videos, and we're uh, grateful for that. Now, as we uh, depart for the day, we uh, want to wish you the very best and want you to know that you're always in our prayers. And we will, uh, we will sing a song first, and then we will close with a prayer. So, of course, we're having a, a little theme song thing going on this, uh, this last month, six weeks, maybe a couple months. We want to keep you uh, happy and encouraged, and so we have this song that we're going to sing. There's a dark and a troubled side of life. There's a bright and a sunny side to Though you need
with us. We just pray that you're safe. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you provide for us. We thank you that we can look down the barrel of a gun called coronavirus and come out victorious, Father. We know that you're on our side. We know that we have to keep on the sunny side and we have to keep looking to you because you are the sunny side. Father, we ask the Holy Spirit to be with us, protect us, protect uh, the members of this church and the congregation. We ask you to protect the people who are viewing us on video, whether they're members or not. Father, you bless us always and just give us the strength and the patience to get through this, Father. We will be back again uh, worshiping and celebrating you soon. We will fill this house with laughter and joy and prayer. Father, we thank you for being with us every day of our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being with us today. Stay safe out there.